those kind of contracts, I put this in here because it's an old, um, it's an old bond that was used to finance the dikes in Holland. And it is a contract that, uh, it's a perpetual contract. It's a bond that was created and it's going to pay for as long as that water company, which owns the, uh, w which borrowed the money in 1648, as long as that water company exists. And so Holland can't exist without the water company, right? And so this thing has, has paid regularly, um, you know, for, for, for centuries. So um, every 10 years or so, somebody from Yale climbs on a plane, Takes, a, takes this piece of paper, or parchment, over there, uh, presents it to the water company, and, and collects the interest. Um, so, as a finance professor, when you're teaching people about time and money, this notion that there's this infinite stream of payments going out into the future, and that somebody had conceived of this, and then they'd figured out how to mathematically construct a limited kind of value to this, is really kind of a, a cool thing. Uh, a lot of the book has to do with money. And uh, here's, a, here's a, a gold coin, I think, actually. We talked about this earlier today. The first coins in Asia Minor were made from electrum, which is a mixture of gold and silver. This one looks pretty gold, and it looks a lot like a coin that's on display right over here. It looks, you know, it's almost like a bull and a bear. We have the lion and the, and, and the bull actually fighting each other on this. but. <clears throat> Um, the first coins in in uh, the Greek uh, culture were tiny things like like the size of a, uh, your fingernail or, or sometimes a lot lot smaller and the puzzle is why is you know why did they appear and why did they appear all across this your Asian con you know they appeared in China in India and also um, in uh, in Turkey all at about the same time in, in ancient history and it has a little bit to do, I think, and the theory in the book is that it has to do with this process of, of global trade networks that uh, expanded to the point where you had, uh, you had to have some kind of anonymous units of account, uh, anonymous methods for, for paying people. Uh, and <clears throat> so, so these things appear in about, I don't know, 600 BC. But by the time you get to the golden age of Athens, um, money becomes a central tool of the government. So there's one chapter in the book that is about the relationship between democracy and money. And you would think uh, in today's uh, day and age, it might have to do with you know, contributions to, uh, to political campaigns. But the, this is the, um, these are pictures of uh, the Athenian coin which has Athena uh, on the obverse and the owl on the reverse. Uh, and if you've ever been to Athens, you've seen the Parthenon, and you see these pictures of the Parthenon, and the, they show you this, uh, what it looked like in, in, the, in, in, in antiquity, like there's a statue of Athena in the main room, and beautiful gilded statue and so on, two, two stories high. Nobody ever takes you around to the back of the Parthenon and tells you why that's important. Because the back room is a little smaller, but that's where they kept all the money. And they kept millions of drachmas in the back of the Parthenon, and that was the real powerhouse of, uh, of Athens. That was, th this coin was accepted uh, very broadly through the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and so Athens, instead of having to export something uh, in return for the grain it had to import, Athens actually was able to, um, uh, to, to to just pay with the silver, and they had a silver mine uh, close to Athens. So this um, this became the, the the driver for for how Athens became economically um, uh, powerful. But <clears throat> the real sort of heart of the democracy was uh, getting people to buy into a collective uh, collective uh, government. Um, and, and Athens had started out with, uh, like every, like many places, sort of uh, family, tribal kinds of connections, and uh, people were, in some sense, coerced into um, uh, committing to a common, um, uh, common government through a series, th through this process of being paid in coins. 
um, so for, 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 for public tasks. So a lot of the citizens of Athens um, would, uh, would get rewards, sort of Pavlovian style, they'd get rewards with these coins that represented the city for doing, uh, for, for, for doing things. One of them uh, is for serving on juries. So we, we don't like to serve on juries now because uh, it takes time, you don't get paid. Uh, in Athens, the juries would be 500 people at a time. So, you know, five times the number of people in this room right now. You would get paid for serving for a day. The trial would be over in one day. And the trials, some of them were about, you know, somebody breaking somebody's leg, but mostly they were about um, people suing each other uh, about business. So imagine a city where they circulated through all the citizens of the city and then they had to listen to really complex arguments uh, about uh, who owes whom for what kind of deal. And these were things like loans uh, for uh, shipping uh, grain from the Black Sea or um, um, uh, mining, there would be companies that were formed to, to mine some mine silver and you would hypothecate the company and, and uh, people would have uh, peculiar claims against, uh, against this, uh, this asset. And <clears throat> so when I started doing the work for this book, um, what I realized is that the, the Athenians must have had an incredible level of financial literacy because we have a few of these dialogues uh, that have survived. When I read them, it's hard for me to very quickly figure out uh, the financial logic of them. But imagine a situation where you're a lawyer, you have to win the case. You've got to convince 500 citizens that you're on the right side. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, whatever the lawyers were, you, whatever language, whatever mathematics, whatever concepts they were using, they had to be uh, intelligible to, to a broad jury. So what this sort of tells us is, in Athens, the, the level of, sort of business know-how was, was, I think, well beyond what the business know-how of the average U.S. citizen is now, and that it was a, a place of incredible uh, entrepreneurial uh, energy. So that went along with um, that went along with, uh, with uh, that was a, a part and parcel of this uh, process of paying people to be part of the civic government. Um, I told you money also has another component in uh, China. Uh, China has its own monetary philosopher. The first economist is Chinese, and there's a lot of stuff in the book about um, uh, about uh, a man named Guanzi, who was um, who lived about 500, 400 BC. He was a monetary theorist who had this notion that if you want goods to come into your country or you want to be able to sell goods to another country, you, made, you adjusted the money supply. Okay, so either print more money or, or, or print less money and it would affect your um, balance of, of trade with other countries. 